Darling, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark Year. You know, a lot of us gals think we know a thing or two about makeup. <laughs> I mean, even those of us who really don't need it. But honey, even I could learn a secret or two from the Oscar-winning genius you're about to meet. He's the guy who put the fur into ferocious hits like An American Werewolf in London and Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes. In fact, when it comes to creating ape costumes for the likes of King Kong and Mighty Joe Young, I guess you could say Rick Baker is one makeup master who doesn't monkey around. He's won six Academy Awards and created unforgettable makeup for such films as An American Werewolf in London, Ed Wood, Men in Black, and the 2000 version of Planet of the Apes. Meet Rick Baker, Monster Maker. I grew up in front of the TV. I was one of the first generations of kids to grow up in front of the box, you know, and, and I liked monster movies. It was the stuff that really attracted me. And, uh, you know, it was during that time where they had that kind of shock theater package where they showed the old Universal classics, uh, uh, you know, every once in a while on TV. And, and I just loved that stuff. Also, I was an avid reader of famous monsters of Filmland, the magazine that was the monster magazine at the time. I just used to, used to like to look at the pictures more than anything else. But uh, I just became fascinated. I used to think I wanted to be a doctor because I really wanted to be like Dr. Frankenstein. Um, you know, when I was about 10, I realized that, you know, I wanted to be a makeup artist. I wanted to be the guy who made the monsters. I started with some. Uh, Grease paint and smearing, you know, the first thing I did was vampire makeup. It was pretty simple, white face, dark circle around the eye, you know. And just went to the library and found out what I could find there. There was a couple books on stage makeup that had some real basic information. Jack Pierce was my first idol. Uh, I, because of the Frankenstein's monster and all the great universal stuff, the Wolfman and all the great makeups that he did. The very first time I did a gash on my hand and showed it to my mother, I got a real response, and, and this is what I was looking for. You know, I, I really, you know, I faked her out, as I used to say when I was a kid. So that started my blood and guts phase, which any uh, friends in my neighborhood, you know, were, that were willing to be victims for my makeup, you know, would, would sit there and I'd do a horrible, gory wound on them and go home with them to, to see the look in their parents' faces. And uh, after a while, I just wasn't allowed to come over to their house anymore because I was that weird kid down the street that did the, the sick stuff. Among Baker's friends was future film director John Landis. In 1973, Landis gave Rick the chance to go ape and create an original gorilla costume for the low-budget Monkey on the Loose movie, Schlock. I made this Schlock Thropus suit by myself in my bedroom uh, in six weeks. I was making up John. John played the Schlock Thropus. And he says, well, my next movie is going to be this film that I wrote called American Werewolf in London. And he asked me if I wanted to do it. And I go, yeah, of course I did, because I love those, you know, werewolf movies, especially the transformation scenes. Something like 10 years went by before we, the film was actually made. Uh, so I had a long time to think about it. As Baker formulated his plan to transform a man into a werewolf, he decided to incorporate mechanical devices in the form of robotics called animatronics in his practical makeup techniques. I thought if I made a fake head and it had an internal structure because it didn't have a human in it that had a, a shape of, of like more wolf-like shape inside this fake head that could push through and, and change the physical shape of it, that could be kind of cool, you know, so I ended up calling it change your head The film used all kinds of techniques. That's what was fun about it. I mean, besides the fact that we had this wolf suit thing that we made, and we had makeups on people, we had masks, we had all kinds of stuff. Armed with his new approach to animating his work, Baker won his first Oscar for best makeup for the ultra popular werewolf film. Baker's groundbreaking animatronic makeup techniques would also play a big role in winning him his second Oscar for Best Makeup for his creation of this towering North American legend. Harry and Harry and the Hendersons, the director Bill Deere, first of all, wanted him to be huge. So 
I thought, well, Harry needs to be animatronic. Until that time, most of the mechanical kind of animatronic were cable controlled, where we had cables coming out the back and levers that you would pull to operate it. Very cumbersome. Harry had to go all over the place, do all kinds of things. They wanted to shoot him with multiple cameras. So I said, we have to make Harry radio controlled. I kind of gave him this kind of pointy head, and I thought, well, this is a perfect place to put the motor. So that on top of his head, we had our little radio controlled servo motors that operated the lips and the, uh, the eyebrows of the uh, Bigfoot. It was the first time we did radio controlled things. Most everything now is radio controlled. I read an article in, in the trades about Tim Burton doing a movie based on the life of Ed Wood and that Martin Landau was going to play Bela Lugosi. I said to myself, I have to do this. I have to do this movie because, for one, I, I'm actually an Ed Wood fan, you know, and, and, and a Lugosi fan and a Tim Burton fan. <laughs> Martin, I thought, was a great actor, but I didn't think his face was ideal. Was, Lugosi has a very kind of round, broad face, and Martin's got a long face. There were a lot of things that he didn't think were right, and, and I, I, looking at him, I thought, you know, it's tempting to put too much rubber on him. So what I ended up doing was uh, he had a nose that changed the shape of his nose to look more Lugosi-like, a chin that, that gave him the, the cleft chin, uh, uh, an upper lip piece that covered his full upper lip and created that long, that long space there. Uh, ears that, that gave him uh, you know, bigger bigger ears and, uh, and a hair piece and, and some careful painting. How the Grinch Stole Christmas was a really interesting makeup challenge. We all grew up with the, the Seuss book and everybody's familiar with the Chuck Jones version and, and, and see it every year. And it's kind of like you couldn't do either one of those things in, in, in real life on, on an actor. So it was challenging to try to design something that looked like the Grinch that we, we knew and loved and, and worked, you know. And when they told me uh, Jim Carrey was going to play the Grinch, I thought, that's great, because he's so animated. And he, can, you know, he can do things with his face that nobody else in the world can do. We did 12 different makeup tests uh, for Jim ranging from what we ended up with, which was pretty much my first concept, to just painting Jim Carrey green. They finally decided my first approach was the right approach. But if there's anything Baker is most noted for, it's his mighty apes. From Dino De Laurentiis' King Kong to Gorillas in the Mist and beyond. They called me about a remake of Mighty Joe Young. And, uh, you know, Joe was the other giant gorilla movie that I loved as a kid. We built three full scale Joes. Uh, one, it's a quadruped Joe. The legs wouldn't move, he would just shift his weight and rock back and forth. And the head was fully animatronic. We have a seated Joe. Uh, who, again, the head moved, the, the arms moved, his torso moved, he sat there. These were two big hydraulic machines. And then we had a big, uh, what we call dead Joe. But the majority of the film is a, is a man in a gorilla suit. I really wanted our big mechanical Joes to look exactly like the guy in the suit. And I also wanted the computer model to look exactly like the guy in the suit. So we took advantage of the cyber scanning technology. The cyber scanning uh, information was in what they made the computer model out of as well. So they all, all three matched up really well. The problem I had when they contacted me about Men in Black was it's going to be really hard to make aliens that don't look like something we've seen a million times before. I thought it might be interesting to have in Men in Black headquarters like a guy that's a saucer man, and you recognize it as this guy from the movie, and you had, even E.T. could be there working on, as an operator on the phone or something, you know. They didn't like that idea, <laughs> so I threw that one out. But what was fun about it, Men in Black, was it, we got to do all kinds of stuff. We had makeups, like the Vincent D'Onofrio makeup. We had animatronic things. We 
had men in suits. We had little puppets. We had big puppets. We had, you know, fake heads. We had all kinds of stuff. It was a little bit of everything I've done for my whole career. Every day I come to work, I pinch myself. You know, I mean, I, I'm living my dream, basically. I mean, I, as a, I started as a 10-year-old saying, I want to make monsters for a living, and hopefully someday I'll be able to work on a movie and get paid for this, you know? And it happened. I get paid to make toys and play with them. I'm kind of insulted when somebody says, well, you're, you're pretty normal for somebody that does what you do. <laughs> I don't think normal is necessarily good, you know. I've always been weird, and weird is, weird is good, I think. You know?